I'm just curious, when you're faced with the pressure, your boss comes to you and says, you're the one who gets to design the next 9-11. Is that really a dream job or is that quite a pressure cooker that keeps you up at night? Scholars Live, Fresh Brewed and Air Cooled Deep Tracks with Cam Ingram. I'm Ray Schaefer and today's style Porsche is Tony Hatter. Well, there you are, Cam, the first intro with our new synth groove, Fresh Brewed Beat by our dear friend, Mr. John William Oates. How cool is that? It's unbelievable to have the infamous John Oates from Hall & Oates write a theme song for us for our special little show. It's, it's surreal. What a car guy. So what a great beat. I love it. I love the music. It's great. It's awesome, awesome. Well, if you're just joining us for the first time, you're wondering who in the world are Cam and Ray and how did you end up here? We don't know about the how did you end up here part, but uh, we are two passionate people whose work requires a daily deep dive into Porsche history and heritage. Cam is the owner of Road Scholars, a multiple Concord winning restoration expert, author and public speaker. And I'm Ray Schaefer, former GM of Brumos Porsche, racer, speaker, now flying the flag at Porsche Classic. And today we are driving down deep tracks of Porsche history with a man whose work it is to make Porsche dreams a reality inside style Porsche, our head of design quality, Mr. Anthony Robert, Tony Hatter. Tony, welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm also really honored. Um, Cam also. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, thing you guys are doing, and uh, this could be the beginning of something big. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, we're having a lot of fun with it, and it's it's we so love having these conversations with folks like yourself and, and our our friend John. And, and last last time we spoke with Bobby Ray Hall, it's just been yeah. wonderful opportunity for us, and it's a thrill to have you here with us today. So I'm as I said, fantastic. So <laughs> what do we want to talk about? Porsches. <laughs> Let's talk about Porsche. Porsche. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. Kim, well, first, uh, Tony, what, again, I just raised an amazing introduction, but uh, for all the Porsche fans in the universe, thank you for all you've done for the brand that we all love so much. It's a real honor to speak with you. So why don't you tell us how you got started? Yeah. And as I said, uh, I had written down one or two things to talk about and uh, and I came down to the bottom of the list, and the bottom of the list is John Oates. <laughs> and uh, he sent me, a mate. I've met him at that, that thing in Atlanta with you, Ray, uh, a year or two ago, and I met him briefly. Uh, but then we set up this thing where we would come to Weissach, uh, Stuttgart and Weissach. And uh, before he arrived, he sent me a, a mail of a picture of him in a pub with a pint with his friend Peter Stevens having a pint. Peter Stevens was my tutor at the Royal College of Art in Is that right? 79, 80, and wow. uh, is really my mentor. And I, I, he's the reason I'm in this game, in the car designing game uh, at all. And suddenly this picture of John Oates, who's coming to see me, was a picture of Pete, which I thought, how the hell? So anyway, I didn't realize, I hadn't realized how deeply involved um, John was in motor racing in those days and with the Richard Lloyd and Richard Lloyd got his graphics and cars done by Peter Stevens. I even remember having to cut out race numbers for Peter in the old days when we were <laughs> students. So uh, a circle closed uh, with that photograph. I got onto, jo onto um, with a mail onto uh, John to find out how on earth that connection happened. But uh, that was a funny funny situation well and for those of you who are watching that might not recognize the name peter stevens um, well, yes. among, right among other things peter has is responsible for the design of um, of the mclaren f1 right that's correct yeah he was a tutor at the royal college of art so to just go back a bit further um my interest in porsches was probably a bit earlier than, than the, in 1970 but in 71 i went to Leeds, North Yorkshire, with my best friend, Keith, to see the film Le Mans with Steve McQueen. 
And that film, to me, is still the ultimate car guy film. Okay, American Graffiti, there's one or two others that, that I just love. But that was the film that, that uh, started the whole thing off. And um, that was 71. It took me a while to get into the car design business because I still didn't realize people drew cars for a living. Nobody tells you that in school. Um, so it took a while, a couple of um, wrong turnings, engineering, flunking this and flunking that. And then, then I ended up at a school in Coventry, being sent to Coventry um, for, for industrial design with transportation in brackets. And uh, I didn't really know what I was letting myself in for, but that, in that course, I learned that there was a thing called car design and car styling. And Peter Stevens was illustrating my favorite magazines, which were popular hot rodding and things like that. And, and his drawings were in there and I would try and copy them. But how does he do it? You know, uh, so that's where it all started in the, in the, in the 70s. Man, I didn't realize, I didn't realize that, uh, that he was illustrating. I remember Hot Rod Magazine and- you know, that's Well, the, the British, there's one called custom car and uh, hot rod and stuff there were british counterparts to the uh, stuff that was happening in america fascinating so that's interesting oh, yeah. because I, go ahead ray i was just going to say when we talked when we talked with john he had told us he told us how living in the united states he was uh, attracted to this set of hand-me-down road and track magazines which with <laughs> a window cool. yeah was, yeah, it's a window into the European world. And here you are in Europe with a window into the American world with Hot Rod Magazine. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. You could hardly get those things in England. I was a, a hot rodder. And in fact, when I left college in 1980, I bought a hot rod from Peter Stevens. It was a 1956 Peugeot 203 Famial estate. Uh, with huge wheels and tires and bucket seats and stuff, but it didn't have a hot engine. It still had the original <laughs> Persia engine. But that's the car that I drove to Germany in, in, in uh, 1980 with wow. all my belongings. <laughs> Tell me, can you talk a little bit? I, we have one shared uh, interest or experiences. I, I took some classes at the Royal Academy of Arts for bronze, pouring, and sculpture. Um, can mm -hmm. you talk about your time there? Because I, I believe you took some drafting classes that really changed kind of some of the trajectory of your design life. Well, is that true? Well, it, it, it was, as I said, it was difficult to get into this thing. And I went to Coventry uh, Polytechnic. It was called Lanchester Polytechnic in Coventry to do industrial design transportation. And it had been set up about five, six, seven, eight years earlier than the course by people from the industry, because that's the Midlands of England is, is the area where the motor industry is or was. And um, it was set up by them, but the tutors that had taken over the course were, um, they were very green, uh, as opposed to uh, not liking cars, you know, it, it was more like uh, designing public transport systems and electric cars i don't know it, it just wasn't the, the stuff that i was really interested in and when they saw me trying to do elaborate drawings they weren't very um enthusiastic about the whole thing so i spent quite a while at coventry it was a four-year course which i managed to pass doing industrial design these sort of things related to transport but in the evenings i was doing car sketching because i knew i had to get somehow further on the basis of that course i wouldn't get into the industry and I applied at the Royal College of Art, which is a two year post-grad course. And uh, on the basis of the stuff I'd done in the evenings, had nothing to do with what I, was, what I did at the, at the college. On the basis of those sketches, I was accepted on the course, sponsored by, in those days, it began as Chrysler, because Chrysler bought Peugeot, uh, the Roots Group companies within England. So I was sponsored by Chrysler in the early days. And um, that became then PSA eventually. So that, that's how I got to see it. So what was your question, Cam? I <laughs> sidetracking. No, no, it was fascinating. I just, I know that you took some uh, courses at the Royal Institute of Art that uh, really were- The Royal, Royal College of Art. Yeah. Royal College. Uh, the Royal College of Art that were really pivotal in some of your drafting skills. 
you know, somewhere. Well, that, that, and, and that place, they, they had connections to industry. The correct kind of guys would come. Guys, Ford was just around the corner. People from Chrysler would come and show you how to sketch and so on. And I did a couple of summer semesters then in a styling studio. So that's when your eyes open and think, wow, so this is what goes on. This is what you have to do. Uh, so it was a hands-on post-grad course, really. That's where I picked it all up. And of course, you tried to, uh, you applied for a job at Porsche. Is that correct? After grad? Well, I, I, yeah, I wanted to come to Germany. Uh, I wanted to go to Porsche and I didn't get a job. There were no places available. And I applied to Opel. They, let, they gave me an interview in Rosenheim in Germany and um, offered me a job. And I thought, okay, great stuff. Uh, so I ended up uh, in the General Motors fold, which brings me to another story. Um, I don't know if anybody uh, realizes that, that the Porsche Design Studio and Porsche Styling is basically uh, an outpost of General Motors putting that a bit blunt, bluntly, but um, the whole thing connection. was set up. Do, you, do you, any of you realize the connections? I do, I do. I'm fascinated. I'm, I'm actually, I, I can't draw to save my life, which is why <laughs> I'm so fascinated by the type of work that you do, Tony, um, because I've read so much about it and I just, I've, I've only once been into a design studio, but if I'm not mistaken, you're referring back to Harley Earl's creation of the design industry, basically automotive transportation. That's right. That's and right. And having uh, your predecessors, uh, your boss's predecessor, basically setting up um, the design, having himself come from General Motors and working. Yeah. Uh, that's as I understand, but by all means, please, you tell me. Well, yeah, well, you did, you did right. What do they call it? Color and, uh, and design? Art and color. color and color. Uh, color and art, I think they called it in General Motors, and, and it became a huge department in the tech center. And Tony Lapine was instrumental, or partly instrumental, in the Corvette projects with Larry Shinoda and these guys. Right. And he went over and he, I don't know what his position was at Opel, but he was at Opel. And um, also Peter Reisinger, Wolfgang Möbius, Dick Soderberg, these guys, and they all kind of mutinied. Uh, Tony was lured away from Opel to set up the design studio um, or the design department, styling department in the uh, late 60s, early, I'm not sure exactly when, because this is when the, um, the family moved out of Porsche. It's when Ferdinand Pieck, uh, uh, Wolfgang, all these guys, and also Butzi, and Butzi was up until those, that time the chief designer. So they all moved out, so they had to get somebody to be a chief designer, and it was Tony Lapine. And he brought with him Wolfgang, Peter, um, Dick, and I'm not sure if anybody else came. But so they set up this studio, and they even had a hand in setting up and designing the studio. Which So when I arrived in 86, I didn't know any of that. And Tony hired me, but it was like walking into a, a very small mini version of Opal. It, the, the three studios, they had this great big brown band around halfway up, up the walls. There were movable pneumatic boards for tape, doing full size tape drawings, but also really small. And um, it was a while later when I was doing uh, external projects for Porsche, I went and visited the tech center. And I went in there and I thought, wow, this is a huge version of Opal. So this, there's like three, there's the tech center, then there's Opel, and then there's Porsche Styling Studio, which was in the cellar um, in Bysak. This was the octagonal building? Pardon? Yes, the, the, yeah, the hexagonal, yeah, which yeah, isn't yeah. there anymore, by the way. Well, it is, but our, we have now have a brand new styling studio, which opened about four or five years ago. It's a huge purpose-built building, bigger than the hexagonal, center you talked about and uh and just just to close this uh story um it was at the the event of the um the franklin motor show a couple of years ago um and i got a call from a friend uh clay dean yes and he asked if he could visit with the general motors design staff if they could visit our new studio to have a look at it because they're building a new studio. So, so 
um, Ed Welburn turns up with about 16 of, of all his top guys from Australia and England, all, all the head chief designers of General Motors visited us at our design studio in Porsche. And I thought, wow, this is fantastic. The circle's closed itself. Yes, it has, hasn't it? Yeah, that was terrific, terrific. Well, I, I imagine in the time that, that you've been with uh, Porsche Design, as you mentioned, from 1986 to yeah. today, the changes that you must have seen in, uh, in the design studio environment, I can, I can only imagine, you know, Cam's talking about the art school and the sort of the hands-on sculpting, yeah. right? And does that even still exist today? Are you still oh, working? Yeah. Definitely, definitely. Because most people think, oh, you design everything on, on computers. Well, computers are only um, an extension of your eye and your brain and your arm and, and your pencil. And um, everything starts here. And um, uh, it, it definitely is a hands-on thing. We, we do a lot of stuff in computers. We do a lot of stuff in Photoshop. We do a lot of stuff in alias 3D modeling on screens. And then it's milled into small or full-size models, always. And we have modelers, wow. designers, and they cannot wait to get their clay scrapers and start changing what they've just done. <laughs> what they just spend a week doing on the, on, on the screen, change it all, and then, okay, then it has to get remeasured re and, and so on and resurfaced, put back into the screen. The poor old alias models have to remodel it to look like the clay model, then change it again, then it gets real. So there's a big ping pong game going on, but it is hands on. And, uh, and I know Michael Maurer says it, that we can never do without models. There always have to be models. And there's, there's another reason for that, because if you're, and I'm looking at the screen now, but nobody else is looking at my screen. If, if I'm doing a model on the screen, nobody can see it. But if you have a model standing there in the studio, everybody sees it. And even if they walk past it, oh, that looks crap. So you're getting a response and, and uh, it's input, it's all valuable input. You have to have a model there and it matures as well. So even if unintentionally you're hearing these comments and things and people are interacting with you, it's the best thing is to have a 3D model. That's a great segue for something I've always wanted to ask you, Tony. Obviously you're one of the fathers of the 993, uh, 911. What what was it like when you produced the clay model for the first time, when your hands started to shape it? What were the reactions in the studio? Well, it, it's hard to say that. It, it might sound a bit strange, but it's, it's like business as usual, you know, because we're modeling, the, all, it's not just the one model there. It's you're modeling it with, the, well, I'm not modeling, but I have modelers modeling it. And um, it, really, it really is business as usual. Uh, there's the next studio that was the nine, the 989 was happening, where all the action was uh, focused in the in the 1989, 90, That's where the that's where the main focus was, and then of course it changed to the nine, nine six, nine eighty six. So so we were sort of, we we're, we're not in a corner, but it wasn't the focus. What was great was that the models I was able to work with were Ernst Bolt, Hans Springman, and uh, Heinz Unger. Ernst has unfortunately died a couple of years ago, but the other two are still around, and we see them every now and then. So, it, and these guys worked on the last three, five, six on the on the sea. They did the bumpers. Wow. Stuff. Really? And, and here I, and then they did the 901. And here I am saying, well, can you move, you know, it, it's, it's kind of weird when you think about it. This guy, this Brit, not completely fresh out of school, but anyway, joining these these guys to mo remodel and rework uh, an icon, uh, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> Tony, can you give us a sense? Um, how much is that continuity in the team of people that you have in the studio? When you talk about somebody who had worked on the 356, and who is still there in the in the late nine eighteen eighties and the early nineties? How much how much do you attribute Porsche's success in being able to move the design language forward to the consistency of the people 
Um, or is it all just a sort of a management thing that says, no, you know, they know how they know how to pull the design back so that it still looks like a Porsche. How much of that is management driven and how much of it is the actual talent that is on the team doing the work year after year? I would say may, mainly within the design department, but we do have reviews and we have a very, even in those days, there were, there were milestones along the, um, along the way to look to review models. And we didn't just do one, we did, Oh, we did just do one, but it had two sides, you know, a right and a left, where we could experiment with different kinds of vendor treatments. Um, but it was basically the design, the design department and the management. In those days, it was Dr. Rita King, and he had full uh, uh, trust in us. He was uh, very supportive. Uh, so yeah, that's how it that's how it happened. And. Uh, I was going to elaborate on, on the forms and shapes of the 993 because it, it, it didn't just happen on its own. You, if you look at it, you can see that where it's coming from. Obviously, it comes from a 911 because uh, there were bits of 911 we had to carry over. There's 959 flavor in there. Uh, there's also 928 flavor in there. So it's all in there and it's all in our brains. And, and it's something that you, you just sort of carry on doing. You know, the 993, Tony, I've, I've read a few of your interviews and videos, and I think the 993, one of the things that you've illustrated are that how well the body highlights, you know, what, when I you think, look at that car, with that, it's amazing. Yeah, I think I sent, I sent a picture, Ray, that one of them is the, is the clay model, yes. you, and that shows the clay model with hard edges. Yes. You perhaps, yes. You could perhaps uh, put that one up. And if, if you get everything lined up and hard edges and, and proper proportions with the bands, the, 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 the chamfers and so on, you know, when you round the whole thing up, round the whole, round the whole thing off, then the highlights will now flow exactly where you put these lines and they will be in the right positions. The front would be a little lower than the rear and you get the front and the rear fenders lined up. Uh, and also in plan shape, get some nice plan shape going. Uh, it was a deliberate attempt to proportionally uh, pull the 964 out of the weeds of it. it it's an, we will put that photo up. It's a fascinating model. In fact, I mentioned it to Cam uh, the other day when we were talking that um, the, the flares on that are so boxed in the front and the rear that it's almost, to my eye, reminiscent of uh, how the 944 has the box. Well, yeah, exactly. And look at the 940. It doesn't, doesn't on certain lights have a beautiful highlight and those, those fenders. Um, and the guy, um, my chief was Dick Soderberg. He was my studio chief. And he wouldn't allow us to, to round off these, these boxy uh, edges until we were definitely sure that the thing was correct. And he would push it outside wow. of the viewing yard on the turntable. If it was working, get it to turn around. Uh, and, and stand back, even put silver foil on these things so you can see a little, little reflection in the surface uh, and control, and we talk about the highlights, control the highlights, that's what it's all about. And if you think about a shape, a, a glossy black shape, take, take, take a, a beautiful um, prie in black, mm. you can't yeah. see the shape, but you can see the reflections. And they are defining the form. It's how the light reflects and off the surfaces that you, you appreciate how the form flows. Do you see it that way in your head when you're designing? Do you see it as a reflection yes. as opposed uh, to a line? Yes, because even when you're sketching. So how do I illustrate this? Well, okay, uh, you take, if, you if you took a, a bent piece of shiny metal, you, you'd, you could see how the reflections, reflections run in that and you can change the curvature of the of the metal and and that's how you would draw a car you draw the car you draw the outline of course but then you start to try and make it look like it's a shiny piece of metal and then you try and draw the reflections in there wow. how long do you have to see something as an artist you make the clay model how long do you have to see something in the process to know if you've gone far enough in the design or that you've done too little. In other words, the 964 is sometimes criticized for not, not having been, even though the car was mechanically 80 some percent new, yeah, yeah. design wise, it, it wasn't far enough. And 
then you have the 993, which we all look at it now and then really as just such a the perfect form of an air cooled 911, if you will, yeah. in my opinion at least. Yeah. And so, how do you know when you've gone too far, and how do you know when you've when you have gotten? You did, and you did right, and it is a tightrope walk. It's a knife edge, uh, but we have certain um, design clues that we adhere, adhere to. There's the DLO, you know, the rear window and stuff that you can, you can draw one one complete line up from the windscreen around the rear quarter light and go back down and follows down through the uh, over the uh, top of the uh, cannon tubes, if you like. So that, that's uh, an iconic line on a 911, which no other car has. The, the front fenders are higher than the, uh, than the hood. The car sits on shoulders. So there are a number of things that you have to um, always have. Uh, the top of the car, the cockpit tapers towards the rear and flows into the rear. And if you analyze the Macan, say, or the Taycan these days, they all have similar features. That, that make it look like a Porsche. We have a design uh, philosophy, uh, a form language. <laughs> it is a form language. Tony, what, what's your, I've, I've wanted to ask you for a long time, what's your impressions of the 991? Because, uh, you know, you can see this evolution after 996 to 997, and the 997 has these design elements that mm -hmm. seem like a modern 993 in the front end. But I, I'm interested to hear your comments uh, about the 991. I have some ideas about it. It, it looks like a modern 993 stretched out in many ways to me. Well, I'm not sure what you want to hear from you. Uh, I, I love the 991, um, and I was instrumental in doing the 50 year edition, yeah. uh, trying to put some, going back to some uh, retro um, heritage touches to that. So, I love the 991. I especially love the Geysir uh, gray one mm, yes. with a brown pepita interior. And lovely, lovely. So uh, I don't know really what you want to hear me say about that car cam. No, that's okay. I was just wondering your general impressions because I mean, I, I think it's one of the most beautiful modern 911s. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah. I mean, we're playing with proportions here and things drive us to change the proportions wheelbase moves, then we have crash impact at the front and the back and pedestrian safety and so on. And things happen and uh, we think, oh God, look at the size of this, it's getting bigger and bigger. But then you have to do certain subtleties in the form to, to try and disguise uh, how big the car's becoming. But um, uh, the 991 turned out very successfully. We had a very young, bright designer working on it. He's now our in, in exterior chief, incidentally. Um, you need good people on these on these projects. When you when you look at a, a model like the nine nine three, Tony, you know we have twenty years worth of hindsight now in that <laughs> design. And I know I've I've owned one. I absolutely love the nine nine three, and you you still own one. Um, if you could go back and design the car again at this point, knowing what you know now. Um, is there anything you would do differently? I, I just one of those questions I've always wanted to ask. Well, it, I wouldn't. I don't want to point it to any any things I don't like on the car. There are one or two, but I'll tell you what. I had the chance to to redo it, and that was the turbo. So uh, if you take the turbo, the the two S for me is is the nine and three I would buy if I was going to buy. It. I don't. I have a a small um, small body cabriolet with the turbo front because I I love those uh, those gills. I remember lying on the floor modeling that for the modeler because he couldn't understand what I wanted. You know, the, the thing come, the sharp fin, the sharp gills come out the front. Yes. So I had this, I had a second chance to do that car and that's the turbo. So, okay, so that's a good point. So when you, when that's you, awesome. you create the, you create the basic, the, the first car, if you will, and then the variations come after that. Are you often involved in the variations or does that well, I, at these these days, of course not, but in those days, uh, also not not necessarily, but in the I did do the turbo. Um, Steve Merker did the Targa. Uh, the Cabriolet roof um, I worked on as well. That one's got, has the longitudinal um, roof seams to try and give it a little bit of a coupe flair. Um, so I did do lots of stuff on, on, on that car, yes. But it's not normal that the designer has to do the next bin. Well, I, 
I imagine uh, as, a, as an automotive designer, it's not a very large community of professionals that are out there. So I would imagine having, having the idea, the opportunity to design a 911 is a dream that uh, a lot of car designers probably would like to have. I'm just curious, when you're faced with the pressure, your boss comes to you and says, you're the one who gets to design the next 911. Is that really a dream job or is that quite a pressure cooker that keeps you up at night? It doesn't, it never ever kept me up at, at night. Some projects did because of the having to meet a deadline the next day or or over the weekend. Um, and and I, I did say, it did sound a bit strange, but it's like work as usual. These take, things, things don't take a day or two, they take months. And you're working on a clay model with models for months. Um, and you know, the, the start of production is in three years time and it all sounds like, oh yeah, okay. What should we do? That's, you know, but but um, in contrast to that, direct contrast in, and now we're getting onto the GT1 stuff. Um, Harm, the guy was my boss then, and he he said, oh, it, it was it it was just before the summer holidays in '95. He said, this guy's going to give you a belly. He wants to do a race car. I don't know what, but he wants to do something. And it, the guy was Dieter Steinhaus, and he said call this guy when you get back from your holidays. So I did. And uh, that began three years of my life, which I can hardly remember apart from the highlights. Intent. <laughs> to doing a race car, I mean, the more starts on the 13th of June at four o'clock or three o'clock, you know, there's nothing, you can't change dates. And the pre-training is, is in May and, and the rollout is in February. So suddenly uh, that was an intense period. Oh, those three cars, the three GT1s were really intense as a co compared to the 993, which was moderate kind of <laughs> pressure. Uh, the, the GT1 projects were intense. And you stayed with that project all the way through uh, all three versions of yeah. the car. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That started, as I said, it started in the fall of 95. And by Christmas, we had a, a full-size clay model. So, now what's this, the the photo that I see of you presenting the model in this beautiful carrying case? Oh, yeah. Well, that yeah. Well, that Harm wasn't very happy about that because he said, "Oh, um, somebody wants to take a photograph of somebody from the studio. I'm not here." Can you you let them take a photograph of you? So I turn up with a suit on, and and um, that would that model we made for um, Herbert Amphora to take round uh, sponsors. It was a one to four scale model, perfectly painted from my data, which I created in a, in a, in a uh, system, an alias system in those days. So this model we milled, and the Amphora was going around people like Mobile Oil or whoever sponsored, trying to attract sponsors, in, and that was the packing case. But so it arrived in the office. With a, with a film crew and stuff, and Harm wasn't there. I'm thinking, Christ, they're going to take a photograph of me for something. Anyway, they did. Uh, and uh, it was a lovely photograph, and it turned up in the 50 years of Porsche book, which I never realized that was going to happen. So that was quite um, a spectacular uh, thing. So, Tony, me. one of the stories I love about your GT1, the design, not only as a race car that harkens back to some of the most beautiful Porsches. In ever designed as a race car, but you also designed the livery of the car. Is that correct for 98? Um, the, there are three liveries. The first one was done by Stefan Stark, and he took, you know, the, the twirling thing? Can you imagine on, on the, G, the original GT1, the twirling thing? He took a Mobile One emblem and put it into a photo, this is the beginning of Photoshop, and Photoshop, and just went, twirled it, and there it was, and that's it. If you look at the car, the, the the um, what's the, what do you call the dot? The dots per inch is about ten. You know, it's so it's so basic. It's such a basic graphic. Uh, then, then we just elaborated on that for the for the Evo, and then I did. No, I didn't do any of the. I was controlling them with with our designers, but I didn't do them myself. No, I didn't do them. They are some of the I most iconic uh, liveries of the '90s, no doubt. Yeah, and it's all splashed on mobile. One color is red and blue and black and white. Look, they look amazing. Absolutely amazing. Not that the GT1 
just in, in the plain motorsport white as it comes out as either a model or a, a street version is, is absolutely incredible itself. Yeah, so, so I, if you like, I, I can elaborate on, on the GD1 project a bit. So that, that needs so, someone need. So yeah, so then I get to meet Norbert Singer. I think I, I knew him already, but he was the, uh, he, he took one look at our model. And said, Christ, bloody designers, they haven't got a clue. So, you know, he's coming, <laughs> from, he's coming from a pure racing car and I'm coming from a pure road car. And, um, but we had the advantage of this computer aided design system, which they didn't have in those days. They had basic computer programs, but they couldn't surface model, which we could. So it's very difficult for, for Nor Norbert to come to terms with uh, working with the studio. And we quickly made some surfaces, made some models that went into the wind tunnel. And that's where the fun started with Norbert. We did it in one to third scale. Uh, and he, We'd do stuff, model stuff, then it would scan, put it back in the system, redo it. And then eventually we had a, a shape in one to three, which we were quite happy with. And it was scanned and milled in full size clay. They might have sent you some pictures, Ray, I'm not sure. Perhaps of the G of the Evo, the, the Evo was the same kind of, um, from the same uh, design system. And so we had these huge clay models, which are gigantic. We hadn't measured, made anything like that in the studios before. They, we couldn't get the, uh, the uh, things to move them underneath the cars. They had such low front aprons and, and everything. They're just gigantic. And the first one we cast in the studio, gigantic plaster of Paris casts on top of our clay models to make the first um, prototypes. I think the rollout then, was made with cast bits from our clay model sometime in February in, in Vaisa. And, well, then, and then, and then so we did that car with Zach Speed. I think they were the engineering support. And then the Evo we did with Lola cars, with, with Lola composites in England. So I ended up in, at Lola in England with this solid resin model of a GT1. And I was highlighting, <laughs> to get back to the highlights, like highlighting the surfaces and these guys at Lola were thinking, what the hell's going on here? This is a racing car. I've never seen anything like this before. I've got some Polaroid shots of doing that. So th then we didn't win again in Le Mans. And then, of course, uh, 1998, um, Norbert Singer said, OK, this has got to stop. We have to do a proper race car. We, um, we can't. Do what the studio wants all the time. Well, it wasn't because of the studio; they've been winning. Sure. But um, <laughs> so that's when the nine uh, GT one ninety eight started, and we did that solely digitally, uh, milling small scale models in the wind tunnel with Norbert again. And um, no, we never we never made a full size model. No. no. Hmm. Well, that, that's interesting. I mean, no, when we were talking with uh, your friend Stefan Ortelli. <laughs> one of the drivers of the GT198. He was, uh, you know, we were talking then about how the port, the rules were written in such a way that it was really uh, looking for a GT, a, a car that was supposed to be first a road car and then a race car, but because of what the competition was doing, you're absolutely right. Norbert was faced with no other choice but to go the direction of a full uh, carbon fiber monocoque chassis in a racing car, which was the GT198. And Without a doubt, you absolutely knocked that one out of the park from a design standpoint. Has there ever been a more beautiful race car? Oh, it might have been, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, Norbert was, was great about the whole project. He always had the, the French ACO guys there looking at what we're doing. They came into the studio and saw what we're doing, so he didn't keep it in the dark and, and turn it up at Le Mans, hoping that they would say okay. He got the okays as, as we were going along. Um, uh, and we made a running road car of each single GT1. You know, we sold of the Evos, we sold about 20 or 22 proper road cars. Uh, and I never forget one experience in my life, which, which was 98. The scrutineering for the cars happens in the marketplace in, of Le Mans, of the, of the town. And that's about, about, 10 k's away, yeah. So um, 
the prototype had to get there, the running streetcar. And Bob Wallach drove it and I was his passenger. Oh, wow. Oh, I was wow. the passenger in the white uh, road wow. going one to drive on each stoplight. We had to open the doors because it was so hot. But wow. And uh, drove back with him as well. Bob was a lovely guy. That was, that was for me, uh, that was fantastic. I think Bob, he drove, he drove the, uh, didn't he come yeah. second? No, he was, was he not in one of the um, US cars? He, he was in he was in the other gt 198 one, the one that came second okay he won one came second yeah yeah. Second car. Yep. yeah yeah wow and of course when you were designing this car i mean not only the gt1 series such a, a beautiful series of cars but this was the first racing car as i understand it to be designed some by led by someone other than eugene cole who had, you had followed in his footsteps uh, well, Eugen, Eugen was is, is a traditional um, body draftsman, but a very clever and, work, and with engineering concepts as well, and he worked things out. He worked with us in the studios a lot. He worked on the Boxster um, roof system, for example, and I know Eugen very well. He was so, and and the, but he wasn't involved in the GT ones. I think I think he probably retired by that stage. I don't know. Now. Oh, right. Because Cam, this goes all the way back, as you as you well know, to the 906 we were just talking about recently. So basically, from the 906 all the way to the 962, he was involved in the in the design of those cars, um, and you you followed in those footsteps with the GT1, uh, basically following the uh, 962. Yeah, but, but in, the, in those days with with Eugen, they didn't they didn't design a car and 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 have different proposals. They they were, it was basically done. I don't know, feel somehow. And, and proper traditional draftsman skills, working with people in the uh, in the fiberglass shop to, to make those forms. So, um, but I still in the, on the initial GT ones work with a guy called Horst Reiter. Does this re name ring a bell? I've heard it, but I'm not too familiar he, with his background. He did the in initial center lines for these cars, but he also did the in initial center lines. I think for cars like the. Uh, the 956 and stuff like that. So I'm still working with these guys with the old, and it was the old, as I say, the old school meeting the new school. Uh, in those days, uh, I was the new school. <laughs> and and Norbert Tony, was, what was the most, not listening to the old the school. Most, <laughs> what was the most important thing that you learned in those three years? I mean, those three years had to be grueling in some ways uh, with the GT1 program. Well, it is you know, the responsibility. Back. The responsibility and having a tight time schedule, because designers are the most disorganized, uh, <laughs> uh, uncontrolled bunch of people you, you could meet. They have this reputation within the company of being like that, but you, you can't do that on a project like that. You have to right. be, uh, and and towards the end, especially towards the end of the, of the ninety eight project. Um, the prim primary primary uh, aspect is the air are the aerodynamic properties of downforce and drag, and you're working with these things uh, as a primary um, consideration as opposed to well, that looks good. Let's do it like that. Um, so that's, that's that's the difference. And and I learned a lot about uh, projects, project timing, uh, and that sort of stuff in, with, with those projects. So it sounds like the uh, GT1 program was really the blending of art and science. I know we hear that <laughs> phrase quite a bit. Yeah, well, yes, yes, yeah. Wow. Why don't you, uh, it's a perfect segue to one of my favorite Porsches of all time, the Carrera GT. And well, there you go. The moment in that, I mean, three Halo cars, the 993 GT1 and the so, yeah, so, Incredible. So, then, so then, yeah, so then this project starts up because I was also involved in the LMP 2000 and yes. uh, the bodywork on that car. Uh, and I think it was Alan who, who test drove it at the track and, uh, and then it was put into a box, went into the museum and that was it, unfortunately. Um, and then that led on to um, the Carrera GT. And... Uh, that, that was a show car, or there were two show cars, I think. Uh, and I got involved towards the end of the show car period. And uh, I think it became apparent to everybody, especially when they launched it on the Champs-Élysées, 
the middle of the night in the middle of a pouring downpour, Walter Rill drove it up, drove it up the Champs Elysees. It became apparent to everybody that it needed a roof. So that that would have been, that was the first thing that we had to correct. That it isn't doesn't have a roof. It doesn't have a roof. But that wasn't that's I actually was just a minor part of the whole project. That was another intense part of my life. Um, no, but seeing we got the band back together, as it were, that the team, <laughs> the Prayer GT, were the GT1 team from the from the 90s. Dieter Steinhauser, the project right. leader, Norbert Singer was there, an analyst, and uh, and so on. So um, it was great working with those guys again, and quickly became apparent that the concept of the of the show car wouldn't work. We had to put the radiators at the front. Uh, we had to make the car much longer. There had to be a fuel tank between the engine and the uh, and the driver's cell, and uh, and so on and so on. And the car. Is, in every way different to the show car, but it sort of adhered to the the honesty of the show car. So that that was an intense project. Wow. It sure did. It sure yeah. did. Well, so what what difficulties? You mentioned the uh, the radiator, for example. Cooling was difficult. The aerodynamics were difficult because the show car was basically, oh, this looks good. Let's let's you know this is a show car. It hadn't seen a wind tunnel, so um, and of course, no was seeing it. Jesus Christ, you bloody designers again. So uh, it, was, it was back to the same, but this time it had to look good and it had to look like a show car. So that, we always had the show car in the corner. And uh, so that, that was the, um, that was the um, uh, goal of, of our car to make it as much like the show cars we could do within constraints, aerodynamic packaging, budget, things like this. Um, and, and so then these things come to my mind. Uh, I also attended the press launch, which was at a, an old bomber air base north of Berlin where they had runways that were miles long. And Walter Röhl and, uh, and uh, Roland Kusma were the test drivers to show the journalists what this thing would do. Um, top speeds of over 300 k's. I, had, I was once a passenger with Walter Röhl with this speed trapped thing between my knees to show how fast we were in real time. And we did 327 Ks before we had to slam the brakes on at the end of the runway. But anyway, so, so, so they did this thing for three, three weeks and it's typical Porsche um, character. They had a bunch of journalists and they just throw them a key and throw them, throw them a, a road book. Right, you, you guys go out and, and do this course. So, and they were doing slaloms. One team of French journalists crashed a car on a slalom. And we had a meeting and decided we have to control these guys. Somebody has to go out with them on the road in front of them to stop them wreaking havoc, being hooligans and crashing the cars. And so there's only a handful of them and, and me being the designer that just to chat to these journalists in the evening, they gave me a job of being the lead car. <laughs> so I got Roland Kusmal's, Kusmal's GT3, red GT3, and I would drive out with three bunches of journalists in Crayer GTs buzzing around behind me, trying to get going. And everybody thinks that they're auto, autobahns unlimited, which sometimes it is, but generally it isn't. And they would just go berserk. So um, on one of the one of the one of the trips, we the autobahn was blocked off. Loads of police cars, and I come along with the GT3 and the Carrera GTs behind me, and they shove us into this parking lot. And I thought, oh no, we've you know <laughs> just put the cuffs on. It's a fair cop, but and, and we didn't have any car papers. And they were, I think, the Hungarians in the cars, and I'm not sure who they were, but they're all foreign, including me. And uh, they didn't really, the police didn't understand what was going on. And uh, but they were, we were very close to the Polish border, and they were looking for car thieves. They were not interested in us because I thought they'd seen us blasting past every day ten times, you know. <laughs> No, they weren't arresting us. They, were, they thought the cars had been stolen. Oh. Eventually, somebody from the GO comes along and um, uh, sorts it all out. But that was a really strange, strange occasion for me. So you get to do everything in my job. I'll say, I'll say, because didn't you, 
Uh, not to take us backwards in time, but I understand that you had a unique experience, again, in talking with uh, Stefan Ortelli. Obviously, his experience at Lamar being a driver is very unique, but as a designer, um, you also get to do a little bit of work at Le Mans. Well, I, I was the spy, <laughs> a number of spies, because uh, I spent uh, about eight days at Le Mans. The team, we had, we had the two, uh, on 98, we had the two uh, coupes, then we had the two years cars, and they all had the same graphics. And each car has three or four different fronts and rears and doors and spare parts. And every one of these had to have the same graphics and they had to match. So I spent the whole week coordinating with the guys doing this kind of stuff, doing the, doing the, uh, doing the applications and so on. And then, but then when the flag fell, the starting flag, I was the spy in the pits. And I had to look after, spy. I had to spy on the Nissans and the Panos. <laughs> and record the driver changes and how much fuel and this kind of stuff. We report back to our, our spy center in the paddock, which which were the engineers who did Dieter Steinhaus and these guys. They all get these jobs to do. So that that was my job uh, over the twenty four hours. And it became quite it became quite interesting because one by one the competition dropped out, but the Nissans were still running at the end. Or I think they were still running. So. Interesting, interesting. <laughs> without a doubt, without a doubt. And, and yeah, and I had to wear civvies. So I had, I had a civil, I didn't have my, my Porsche stuff on, my uniform. So I had normal clothes, but I had this pants to get everywhere I could. And if you're standing there for hours and then you see other people just like me, with yeah. no uh -huh. obvious team identification, but <laughs> they'd be watching us, you know. You'll have to say, uh, and, and you knew you could see what was going on. The motive designer and spy. I love it. Yeah. That's an interesting resume for sure. That is absolutely for sure. Well, it was a pleasure when we, um, you mentioned coming to Atlanta to be a part of the event that we did back in 2018, the 70th anniversary of Porsche. And uh, we were able to deliver that recommission project that we did on the. Yes. Um, Yes, metallic, and you had some input into that. At that point, we actually followed up with some of the uh, recommendations that you made. Again, because not only did you design the exterior of the Carrera GT itself, but you also designed the interior. And in most automotive design studios, you have an interior studio and you have an exterior studio, and different people working on different things. But the GT is unique in that you, you actually led the design of both exterior. I, I had, I had a, a, a guy working with me on the interior, Hugh Robinson, who did the major stuff on the uh, interior. So it, I, it's not true that I designed the interior. I did have somebody on the, but we, we were satellited out of the studio into a small uh, neighboring studio in the village of Flacht, um, which might sound familiar, made in Flacht. It does. Yeah. So um, I did have help. We were a small group of people working on the Crow GT, a very intense group. Well, the result is absolutely stunning, as we know. Mm. And, and today it's a classic vehicle. It's the newest classic officially. And it's hard to believe because I, I still remember it like it's yesterday, as I'm sure you do. But boy, what, a, what an impressive, amazing machine that is a cornerstone of many Porsche collectors' collections. The show car is now, it's now 20 years old, right? Yeah. Crazy. <laughs> Yes. It's timeless. So that car looks as good now as the day you designed it. I mean, it's one of the most beautiful Porsches ever designed, period. Well, Tony, can you take us to um, take us to today, basically, and tell us what work and life today as the head of design of quality at Style Porsche is like? I mean, what, what is the scope of work that you're responsible for today? Well, we have, we have uh, as, as you know, a huge model lineup now. It's not just 911s and boxes, it's actually the major work are uh, Cayennes and Taycans and, and Macans and Panameras, and then the, the various der derivatives of the 911 and so on. And they all have their cycle plans and so on, whether it's a new model or a, or a um, uh, facelift. Mm -hmm. uh, and these projects are happening all the time. We have a huge staff, we're about 120 permanent staff with up to 180, including uh, leasing staff, modelers, and uh, computer modelers. And um, so, so we have this very strict uh, milestone plan. Uh, 
and we are we are involved in projects for about nine months i think and then then the designs are finalized and okay that's it but that means then it has to be constructed the surfaces have to be been, been made perfect and um previously that would just be the job of the construction department and we would say okay we see you in two years when it runs off the production line but we don't do that anymore we look after uh, everything interior exterior the color and trim the surface the interior the way the interior and exterior surfaces are treated we watch over that and make sure that nothing happens to our design throughout this uh, productionization of our car, our model. So that, that's my job. And I have a team of, uh, we're about 11 people at the moment, color and trim, exterior and interior. And uh, we closely watch and uh, accompany the, the project till it runs off the, uh, the band in Zuffenhausen or Leipzig. Well, that definitely sounds like uh, that's taken from a lot of years of experience and learnings because I've often wondered about some of the wonderful design drawings that you see that come from the mind of the stylists and the designers, uh, but never seem to make it into production. So it sounds like your team is really helping to make sure that the uh, concept becomes a reality. Yeah, we are, we are the feasibility guys in English. Um, uh, mainly from the, the we call it Strat in German, that's the body servicing side, but uh, we have warm-blooded and cold-blooded people in my team, warm-blooded people who are actually designers like me and cold-blooded who are the guys who work on the uh, on this servicing machine. So we're a good mixture of people to make sure the project uh, stays on track, as it were. Well, one of the draw, go ahead to Cam, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ray Ray. Well, I just, I remembered one of the drawings that we were looking through that you sent us was, uh, was not of a sports car at all. And I'm just curious what the story, the story is with the, um, the front loader project that uh, has your the, name on it. The, the fault lift truck. Yeah. Well, uh, and so that brings me on to another aspect of, of my life at Porsche. Porsche always was a construction company before they started making cars. They were a construction company in Stuttgart and they have, up until this very moment, not stopped doing work, engineering and consultancy work for other companies. Uh, these days, it's, it's Porsche Engineering Services, uh, P, 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 S. Uh, but in those days, uh, uh, they had a different title, but we did design consultancy work for a lot of external companies. And in those days, the major company that we worked for was Linda. And we had a lot of downtime in, in the late 90s and, and uh, early 80s, uh, late 80s and early 90s, sorry. And we would be able to fill this time doing projects for Linda forklift trucks. And we, and we still do that. We still have a guy doing uh, forklift trucks. And if you look at the Linda forklift trucks compared to everybody else's, our Linda trucks look great. We think, we think. <laughs> you can see okay. that they've, done, they've been done by um, uh, car guys. So, so that, that's what I did in those days uh, sometimes. And then I have to work out when it was in, in my career in the design department. Um, I became uh, the external project guy. It might have been after the, after the Le Mans car. I can't remember now. And I did a lot of work uh, with other uh, designers for Chinese companies, for some French companies. I visited China a few times, went to Japan. So I, I had a, a great time doing uh, other things apart from, um, apart from sports cars. Sports car. hmm. Keep adding to that resume, right? Add that to the uh, Le Mans spy yes. and sports car designer. Well, right? There's one really ex extreme variation is the uh, the organ in the Nikolai Church in Leipzig. Uh, did I send you a picture of that? I, you know, I remember it from an article in Christophorus in the late 90s, early 2000s. Yeah, well, this, well, Leipzig's now the home of the Cayenne. That's where we have the huge um, Porsche Center in Leipzig. And Dr. Wiedeking um, sponsored the reconstruction, the rebuilding of the Nikolai Church in Leipzig. And it also has a fantastic 
150 year old organ which the communists then thought it was just it looked awful the the, the playing table uh, was 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 awful it was, it was just falling to bits so um, we were given the commission to redesign the organ table not you know not the pipe and stuff but mm -hmm. the, the bit that you see and um, we we did some fantastic stuff in Photoshop and we had the organ people from Leipzig all from East Germany came to the studio and saw these photorealistic renderings we'd done for the um, for the proposals and they were knocked out they said gentlemen you've rewritten the the German organ design book you know and this we said they said we would take this one and they did it they they translated the sketch of one of uh, one of the designers and they made it it's got so you sit in the organ it's got it's got a left hand starter button and then a thing moves up what? and you get and there are five gauges they like it like a 911 and we have to work out <laughs> what can we put in these gauges to make it somehow give them a purpose air pressure air temperature uh, what just a bit like the 911 because that's what they did in those days. They, when they were doing the 911, they had to work out what to put in those five gauges. You know, it wasn't <laughs> anyway. So we did the same thing on the organ, and uh, we used beautiful materials. So if anybody gets the chance to visit Leipzig, not just the experience center, go to the Leipzig Nikolai Church and have a look at the organ. It's fantastic. And I'm more excited to go to Leipzig now than I ever have. <laughs> But it, it was a fascinating project, I tell you. And if you go into the into the into the back room of this church where the organ pipes are, make a guess of how many pipes there are. Organ pipes. No. Okay. Twenty. Eleven thousand. No. Eleven thousand. No, I. The, the the smallest one's eleven millimeters high, and the biggest one, you know, is about twenty feet high at the front. Of the, and, and what a register is, and I didn't know this either, the pulling out all the stops comes from pulling out the register stops. And we had 112 register stops, and each register is like a scale of 100 pipes. So that's what a register is. So each register has got this battery of pipes, 11,000 of things. Most of them are made of wood, incidentally. So they can shave off the top to tune, and so we got in. We didn't get involved with the with that bit of the organ, but um, it was nevertheless a fascinating project that I found myself involved. Well, I'm, I'm ashamed to say this has been the most fascinating part of the dialogue is the <laughs> organ. <laughs> we got well, it. Does, it does provide the perfect segue to talking about um, your musical interests because I understand that um, with a fellow designer. And uh, the man actually who's credited with the concept of the Carrera GT, he's also a musician. And uh, you had a chance to join our friend John and maybe creating your own garage band, it looks like. That would be a dream. That would be a dream. <laughs> I don't know if that will ever happen. Um, we both have guard, garages and guitars, but I don't know if we, if we can get them together. <laughs> You started by talking about the visit that you had from our friend John Oates. That was fantastic, yeah. And uh, we managed- Tell us about that weekend. And we managed to do a jamming session with John Oates. I mean, how it just out of this world. So um, that was great fun. And this my my uh, my personal ambition. I don't know what John will say. Is is, is at one guitar lesson with John in Nashville. So one day I, I'll, I'll try and make that happen. That's um, good. that's good. Photo you sent us is uh, of course I'm referring to Grant Larson who was uh, with uh, the, the three of you that weekend. And um, you also had a chance to go out and do a little drive in the Black Forest in a, the most gorgeous blue 356 1600 coupe. Now, I remember uh, happening upon one of your Saturday, I'm sorry, Sunday breakfast clubs yeah. when I was coming yeah. to visit the factory. And yeah. with all these wonderful cars, Cam, I just, I was doing a dry run from Ludwigsburg down to Stuttgart to make sure that I wasn't gonna be late for work on Monday morning. And as I'm leaving, I see all these wonderful cars parked at the top of the um, the top of the road by what looked like a gas station. It turns out it was a converted gas station, but apparently there's a breakfast club that um, all the designers at Porsche got together on. Wow, it's, it's a breakfast club that, a, uh, that Steve Merkin put together and started, and um, it's a very impromptu thing because you know what you can't rely on the weather. 
Right. And uh, being pansy uh, old car enthusiasts, we never go out when it's when it's raining. You know? <laughs> so if on a Friday it's going to be a great weekend, Steve sends out a mail to hundreds of people. Now we're going to meet on Sunday. We've changed the location because the place doesn't open anymore on on, on the uh, on the Sunday it opens. We we go to a place very near Isaac, but it still happens intermittently. Unfortunately, this year hasn't happened. But um, so yes, that's where I met you. That's right. That's right. I have a, I don't know if I did, ever told you, uh, Cam, I have a, a 58A with um, yeah. the, the original engine uh, is on the shelf. It's in aquamarine blue, flat, with um, a caramel um, interior. Uh, and I've had speeds the seats made. I've got some nice light, lap seat, lap belts. It's got um, a, nine, a 912 engine, a 66. 912 engine with 1720 nice. uh, with dual ignition so I've got about 100 horsepower loads of torque and uh, it's just great fun it's just great fun so that's what I took out with with uh, John when he came to see us what a great story I had no idea Tony you had a at 356a coupe and one of the best colors ever made I, well I was looking for a black car and I, I had four or five black cars that I was looking at and this blue one in Bolzano in, in Italy and I said there's no way I'm going to buy a blue car I've been looking for a black 356 and that's what I want and at least uh, so I made a, a matrix pluses and minuses cost condition all the, all this kind of stuff yeah however I did it the blue car came out on top every time so I had to go and have a look at it and um, it's like falling in love with a with a blonde. <laughs> that I paid the guy what he wanted, which is ridiculous, and and bought it. Um, that's what a great story. story. Yeah, yeah. Well, Tony, uh, our hour is wrapping up soon, and I know that uh, you shared with us a special event is happening here in the near future for you. Why don't you share with us uh, what the future holds for you? What the future holds for me? Yes, <laughs> it's uh, well, it's getting closer pretty quick. PDQ, and that's that's a bit scary. It's hard to believe, hard to believe the numbers that I, you know, but it happens, and it happens. To, I can warn each one of you. Watch out! It just creeps up on you. Um, <laughs> but I'm quite happy. I'm, I'm involved with the the uh, Porsche old old Porsche scene and. Uh, I want to take proper guitar lessons. I want to ride my motorbikes. I've also got a few couple of bikes with that, which I love. So um, <laughs> I sent you a photo of a, of a, of a, a bike, Ray. Yes. Did you see that? Yeah. yeah. That, that looks like a, a wonderful way to get through the Black Forest. It is, yeah. Well, that's it. My wife's not listening. That's, uh, that's a 1986 um, BMW R65. Completely modified, lowered, bigger wheels, uh, 860 power kit, and all this kind of stuff. It's great, I love it. Which, uh, and I have a, a 66 Triumph Thunderbird, which is also a bit of a, a hot rod, which is just basically fright. If you've been on the, on the BMW, you get on the Triumph and try and brake, uh, you think, oh, the brakes are broken, they don't work. But it's just, uh, <laughs> it's, it's a dinosaur from the past. Even the, but the BMW is over thirty years old, but it's uh, relatively modern. So that keeps me awake. Hopefully, I love the look of motorcycles. They just the the style of motorcycles. There's something about what it says you're supposed to do with it, all right there in the design. There's no fluff with it, and uh, I just they're works of art, no doubt. I could just park a motorcycle in the living room and look at it. I, well. Unfortunately, we live in an apartment. I'd love to get one up here, but uh, it's, the idea has been vetoed. <laughs> it won't happen. No. Uh, Tony, we could have a, we could have a whole other show and talk about motorcycles because <laughs> right. know, that's one of my passions, and we could talk motorcycles for a whole hour, if not more. So. <laughs> well, we should probably we should probably do that, but let's. Um, We'll do that offline, or maybe we'll come back when we do the fresh brood and air cooled, meaning motorcycle engines. Uh, <laughs> right. But uh, Tony, wanted to say thank you so much for driving down the deep tracks with us today and talking Porsche. It's been an illuminating conversation. We really appreciate it. Thank
Thank you so much. Well, I thank you too, guys. Well, hopefully, I haven't garbled too much, and and oh. and uh, it's been a bit yeah. comprehensible. Um, we touched on a lot of stuff, and uh, there's probably a lot of stuff that I wanted to say which I forgot. One of the problems when I when I talk uh, proper talks, I usually I have prompt cards, and I go like that, and then I lose my place, and then I forget and go off on the track. So I'm terribly um, unstructured when it comes to um, this kind of stuff. Well, we appreciate the conversation. I mean, this is all just about, you know, having having a fresh brewed cup of coffee and, uh, and getting right. a chance to chat with you. And we really appreciate that. You, your body of work, when you consider from 1986, all the programs that you've been involved with and the, the models that we've talked about in particular, I mean, these are, these are iconic, legendary cars that, um, how, how wonderful that must feel for you personally to be able to go out into the world and, and to see one of these cars parked on the side of the road somewhere at a show. And just, I can only imagine the sense of pride it must, you must feel as a designer. And basically, I haven't grown up because we live in Vysak. So the 9-11s pass all over the place. But if I do walk anywhere, I turn around and I, look, I still look at these cars, you know, just, just doesn't stop. It's not supposed to. That's okay, right? <laughs> We're okay. We're okay. Well, again, Tony, thanks so much uh, from everyone at uh, Porsche Classic. Let's say thank you and Cam. Tony, thank you. What an honor to be with you today. And thank you for your time. And thank you for everything you've done for the Porsche brand. It's incredible. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you. Absolutely. We'll look forward to seeing you at one of the many shows. Tony and thereafter. Cheers. Okay, guys. See you soon. Take care. Cheers.